So I'm going to build on that last point and also on the, one of the first things Mary Bowman said this morning. Increasingly at NAS, uh, and this time just take, get ready, it's going to be statistics because that's what we do. And we're going to, what we're emphasizing is using all the data available to us to get the very best official estimates we can. It doesn't matter whether it's survey data or non-survey data. If it has something to inform our estimates, we want to use it. So for those who may not know, NAS is, provides timely, accurate, and useful statistics and service to U.S. agriculture. That leads us to conduct over 100 surveys each year and to produce more than 500 reports according to a schedule that we adhere to. So. We take great pride, as Keith mentioned, in providing freely available information to everyone at the same time to provide a le level playing field. In addition to our official estimates, every five years we conduct the Census of Agriculture. And guess what? This is a reference year for the 2017 Census of Agriculture. We're really looking forward to this because this year we we're putting in place a census web form that's very responsive that should help reduce the burden on our respondents and we hope that you will if you are in farming or know someone who is that you will encourage you will participate or encourage others to participate in this census as it comes uh, into action toward the end of this year we are going to be talking however about our agricultural uh, crop estimates program and there are three aspects that I want to talk about. First is the way we go about combining diverse data sets now, the role of uh, remote sensing now, and what we hope in the not too distant future, as well as potential data sources. And I want to start with winter wheat. I want to start with that because Estimating winter wheat is very interesting in that there's a lot of complexities when you think about how to get a good estimate of yield and production on the na national level. We have what we call speculative regions, which are comprised of the states that are the primary producers of the commodity of interest. And we have 10 of those states in the speculative region for winter wheat, as shown here. Notice that they're uh, not geographically contiguous, they're spread out. With respect to acreage, Kansas is the dominant player, having over a third of the acres in winter wheat. And we conduct three surveys in support of our estimates for that program. And they're shown both in listing but also time-wise down below. The objective yield survey for that survey, we actually go out in the field, lay out plots, and collect data on a monthly basis. And that's the light blue that you see across the top. It starts in May and goes through September. Then we have the agricultural yield survey. Before I skip, let me say the objective yield survey is conducted only in those speculative region states. It's not a national survey. The other two are national surveys. The agricultural yield survey is an interview survey conducted monthly. And there we ask the farmers, what do you think your yield's going to be? Because farmers have a good sense of that as they go through the growing season. And then the acreage production in stocks, or APS survey, is also an interview. It's a very large sample size and conducted at the end of the season. So it's the little purple down here. So we have the uh, agricultural yield, the AAYS in red. The arrows going up are when we produce estimates. We send out estimates, and at the very end, we have our final estimates. All right, so we have models that we have produced to estimate yield within the speculative regions. We've been developing these models Oh, since 2009, they've been presented in part of our official process since 2011 for coin and soybeans and for winter wheat since 2015. We're in the process of developing one for cotton. To develop these models, we try to combine information, the data from the survey, weather information, and farming practices. 
And winter wheat becomes interesting because you have to think about, you have four primary types of wheat, hard red, soft red, hard white, soft white. And states tend to specialize. They tend to grow more, if not solely, one kind of wheat versus another kind of wheat. So there's a confounding between the type of wheat grown and the state we're considering. Also, the soft varieties tend to yield higher. In addition, we have a very dramatic spatial trend occurring. If you've ever been in the plains during wheat season, you know the combines start in the south and go north. If you look at the top diagram here, it shows basically that action so that the harvest in the south is complete off <laughs> before we even get to the north and start it. And we have to think about that in the modeling process. We also have to worry about the timing of covariates, what's crop condition, the temperature, precipitation that we've had so far on the crop. And so we put this all together in a model, and you'll see for May the covariates, the crop condition, temperature, uh, precipitation tend to dominate. There's not much to see. You'll see at the objective yield only, it only comes into play in uh, Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas because other states don't have enough above the ground to really be of much help there. But by uh, July, the objective yield survey is beginning to really show its importance in the estimation process. Agricultural yield, the farmer's opinion in August, that's dominant. They have a pretty good feeling how that crop's going to turn out. But by September, when we actually have that final, the harvest is, is generally in, we have the dominant is the APS survey. We've investigated, just like in NAS, it's like everybody else. We want to see what the official estimates are and how well our models are reflecting those official estimates. And the red is the official estimates that have been produced. This is for 2012 and black is the model, and blue is the confidence limits. Now we have the 10 states here. We haven't shown which states associated with which estimate due to confidentiality. And what we'd hope is if this is the final estimate, it's flat. We get it in May and it doesn't change, okay? That's not the case in most of the time, but you'll see that our modeled estimate is fairly close to the uh, official estimate in most cases, and in, in the uh, overall, we feel really good about these results. Now I want to turn because I think most of us wouldn't define the survey data and the weather data as being big data. So let's look at our cropland data layer. At that is a classification of all of the cropland across the U.S. to the type of crop being grown on it. We've produced this for nine years now. It's up on the web. People can download the data if they wish. And it's nine billion pixels to produce one map. So most of us would think that qualifies as big. We use these data in a variety of ways. Uh, we've used them to uh, give us insight into the effect of flooding or early snows on our crops. Here we have an example where it provided insight on the California drought what we see is the increasing impact of the drought over time. The green are the, is, are the acres that went fallow in 2011 and then increasing to the red in, in 2014. And you can see the increasing impact of the drought. Now, for the models, I talked about wheat because I find that the most fascinating. It's the most challenging. However, it's not as broadly planted as either corn or soybeans, and so we haven't been able to develop, I had, well, we're in the process of developing is a better way of saying, one for wheat based on remotely sensed data. We do have remotely sensed data informing our estimates of, call, of corn yield and soybean yield. So based solely on remotely sensed data, we have models for those yields and I'm going to talk about corn today. NDVI and uh, the daytime land surface temperature are the two remotely sensed variables that have proven most informative in estimating yield or predicting yield. 
NDVI is a measure of the greenness or the robustness of the crop. So you can imagine as it gets greener and more robust, the yield tends to be higher. And although it's not a linear relationship, you can see as one goes up, the other goes up. Not so with uh, land surface temperature. The higher the land surface temperature, we tend to see a decrease in yield, and you can see that. The relationship isn't exact, but the trend is very noticeable. If I look at this over time for several years, each line represents a different year. Do you remember 2012? The time of the bad drought and production was low. Remember, high land surface temperature is not good. That top purple line, that's 2012. For the NDVI, this curve, the broader the area under the curve, the higher the yield in general. Guess which one that is down below everybody else? 2012. Okay, so you can begin to see that association. We, we take our estimates or our predictions, we put them in maps in 2014, November 2014, here's what you have. The greener it is, the higher the yield. Looks good. 2014, if you'll remember, was a good year. 2013 was all right, but you can see immediately it's not as good. What about 2012? Ooh, all right. So this helps us visually understand what's happening out there in the field. In addition, it's interesting in that we can see the impacts of weather events. The dark purple area is the area associated with a large hailstorm early in the season. And the crop had some time to recover, but you'll see the impact on yield is still evident uh, from our, our predictions. We produce county estimates of yield from, uh, based on our remote sensing, and here we're comparing it to the, those estimates to our official estimates, and you'll see that we're doing a pretty good job. Now the challenge is, from my perspective, is that we have some really nice models of yield, and we have some really nice estimates, uh, and the models are pulling together all our survey data, and we have this nice estimate based on remote sensing. And right now, we're not using either to inform the other. So we have a good estimate here and a good estimate here, and I want a super estimate by putting them together. And that's what we're working on. Easier said than done, okay? But that's what we'd like to do. Another thing we want to do is to use our remote sensing. One of the things we all know is that rain's not the same at all points in the season. Sometimes we really want it and sometimes we don't want it at all. So can we get to the point we can detect the growth stage of the crop remotely and, and time the precipitation and the temperatures more fully in our estimation process? And we have a person working on that very diligently. Now, let's talk about these additional sources of data that we'd like to have, and some we've already heard about. We need two things to be really helpful. One is we need national coverage. If we ha know that there's a special data set in, in one of the states, say Oklahoma, and it's only for Oklahoma, that's not going to help us produce national estimates and we want basic good quality across the nation. The other is timeliness. If we're lucky, we have four days from the time we get the data till we produce an estimate. So a lot of the models that we might think about initially or the things we might think about trying just aren't on the table. They can't be run. If it takes us two months to get out the estimate, we're two or three reports down the road. So that won't work for us. We do use administrative data. The Farm Services Agency has been generously sharing their information on their program and programs, and they provide us with acreage data in a timely fashion. The challenge with this and all other administrative data that I know of, there are biases associated with it. What is it for the Farm Service as an example? Well, not everyone's in the loan programs. So this is a lower bound for acreage. 
We know if our estimate is below the farm, farm services at number, it's too low. But how much above it should it be? And that's part of the, the challenge in using this administrative data effectively. Drones. I'm always asked, are you guys using drones yet? No, we're not. <laughs> now, you can help us. I'll tell you the two reasons why we're worried about that. One is just thinking about calibrating, again, across the nation, because one drone's not going to fly at all, okay? So we have to think about calibration. The second is we really value the, the relationships we develop with our stakeholders, okay? And you might have read in some of the news articles about the impact of a drone crashing on a farmer's field and what happens if it hits a cow, for example. We're concerned about the potential impact that could have and the publicity and how it could harm relations. If you can help us understand how to use drones and undercome, overcome these two issues, we really do want to know about it. Then the on-farm data is probably the most common question. Are y'all using on-farm data yet? And the answer is no, we're not. Access is challenging. We had some encouraging news in that um, access, uh, the Farm Bureau has developed a database in which farmers can put in their, their on-farm data. The challenge we have is that we would need to get permission from each of those farmers to use. And that's not the one that worries me the most. The other is that the farmers put the data in when they want in the format they want. So some will put in very detailed information within a field, maybe every foot. Others will summarize to the field and put that in. And others will, will summarize to the farm level, which might cross several counties. And so trying to get access to data, again, if you know how we can do this in a manner that will help us cross the nation, we're interested. We want to do this. One of our biggest challenges, we think, as an agency is in face of all these enterprises who are now beginning to say we can do estimates as well as NAS. I think it's gone on a long time, but people are listening more now, I think, is we want to be sure our estimates continue to be the very best so that we continue to provide that level playing field. Linda, we're a little past time. Okay, then I'll just stop here. Oh. <laughs>